The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. So, um, as a recap, there we go. Um, as a recap, we talked about mobile device characteristics last time, right? You might remember um, that there were a lot of things that are different in mobile device uh, development. Uh, from doing this for the web or the desktop, right? The context is different. You know, remember the fact that you're, you might get hit by a bus while uh, using an app. <clears throat> but also, of course, there are a lot of diff um, limitations on the technical side, right? Small device, battery is limited, etc. Processing power compared to a desktop is limited, etc. Um, and then there is, of course, a very different design model behind building an app because um, yeah, this is great. Thank you very much. Um, it's only one app at a time, right? Certainly on a smartphone, maybe even on a tablet. Sometimes people share two uh, apps side by side, but it's much more of a um, of a limited experience um, compared to the desktop, right? There's not that much multitasking going on. The other thing we talked about are application styles. Anybody remember those? Uh, what those three were um, examples for? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. So we got the productivity ones, uh, drill down menus typically, right? You know, going in lots of standard user interface components here uh, from, from the UI toolkit. Uh, then you've got utility apps, which are kind of in between, getting towards more of an immersion uh, into a particular simple task, typically just a, a straight, you know, no drill down, just a flat list of objects to pick from, like the list of cities in the weather app, for example. And then we got the immersive ones. Uh, which are actually games, but also other applications that fully custom design the UI. Um, no standard user interface components. Usually, they would kind of stick out like a like a, a sore thumb um, in those designs. All right, so that's what happened last time. Um, and apart from that, of course, we had lots of um, going through, you know, the the hoops, and and you had to jump through some hoops to sign up for the class. But apparently. You did, and you got picked for the class. So congratulations and uh, for, for being here and being part of this. Now, if you do decide to drop the class, please uh, do that quickly um, in uh, online so that we may be able to maybe pull somebody else up. Because as you saw, there were more people interested in taking this class than we had seats. On to Swift, which is, uh, has this uh, wonderful little uh, swallow here as a, as a logo. This is a, a language that was introduced at the Apple's annual developer conference, which is called WWDC, Worldwide Developers Conference, in 2014. So by now, it's actually eight years old, which is quite, you know, quite some time, but not a lot for a programming language. Because it was, of course, the successor to Objective-C, uh, which had been the language of choice to uh, program um, Mac OS and iOS ever since um, Mac OS X first came out in uh, uh, around 2001. So, um, <clears throat> but the language is influenced by these, uh, you know, predecessors, C and Objective-C, so it doesn't actually look too unfamiliar. Um, however, it is designed not to depend too much on all the languages, so it's shedding some things and it's using some modern, you know, um, current day uh, approaches to how a programming language should work. Um, and it's supposed to be easier to learn. Which is, a, which is great news because I can tell you Objective-C and you know, using uh, you know, programming in Objective-C in the early days of iOS was quite a hassle. Uh, it was actually quite difficult to wrap your head around on what was going on. Um, the Swift design team uh, put out three key design goals when they, when they made the language. And these stay uh, uh, until today. And that is they wanted Swift to be safe, fast, and expressive. And of those, actually, surprisingly, uh, fast is one that you don't see very often in programming languages today. Because usually, you know, you've got plenty of processing power and you're not that concerned about this. But Swift was designed to also be a language that you could use to program um, you know, on a system level. So not just yeah, applications that have tons and tons of you know, uh, processing power behind the, uh, on, the, on the computing hardware that they run on, but also for things that are resource constrained, which, of course, mobile devices, in a way, uh, still are. Um, I will talk about these three goals more as we, as we go through the features that, that are included in Swift. But what they briefly mean, save means keeps you from making mistakes that later lead to you know, bad things like your program crashing when it's running. Um, 
fast, obviously, performance-wise. Uh, and expressive is maybe a little hazy. Um, means that it actually lets you express a lot of things very compactly and very easy to read. So it's, it's about, you could almost say, programming language usability and programming language power. Um, Swift was actually made open source in 2015, um, and it is uh, now, rep you know, it's replacing I um, Objective-C throughout both iOS and macOS um, these days. Some of the characteristics, and don't worry if you don't know what all these mean. We'll go over these as we, as we go, but just to give you a couple uh, words here. So the syntax is pretty clean. Actually, no more semicolons at the end of a line. Yay. Um, and that makes, you know, there are other hacks in the, in the syntax, other approaches in how Swift is written that actually make it quite easy to read and make it quite natural to read as a, uh, as a statement, almost as if you were, you know, um, uh, formulating a real-world sentence. Um, it is uh, a type-safe language, so it enforces code that is less likely to, to crash your program, which leads towards the safety issue that I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> um, type inference means that it actually, in many times, um, tends to derive the type of a variable that you, um, um, that you use itself, so you don't often have to declare it explicitly, which sounds like, but that isn't safe, is it? Well, it actually is. Um, type inference means that it actually you know, saves you time in development, uh, and it lets the compiler help you identify common issues. Um, so it both adds to safety and also to the expressiveness of the language. Um, automatic reference counting, ARC. Anybody heard of ARC before? Yeah, uh, wh where do you know it from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in yeah, many, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not in all languages, like you might also have like, you know, garbage collection like you know, we, uh, we've seen in, in Java for a long time, for example, but automatic refer reference counting kind of gives you the best of both worlds. So you don't actually have to manage your memory yourself, uh, but you also don't have an inefficient system managing it for you like you would have with garbage collection, which can kick in at kind of any time and suddenly make your application halt for a moment. Uh, automatic reference counting kind of inserts the, uh, the needed calls to allocate and deallocate memory uh, for anything that you are using automatically. Uh, and I can tell you, this is, this is a big one, right? When you started developing in iOS in 2009 or 10, when we first you know, started doing this, um, this wasn't there. So you actually literally had to manage your own memory. It felt like you know, being thrown back into the you know, 70s or something. And you had to like, do, do malloc calls and stuff like this. So it was, it was not nice. Um, so this makes it both fast to develop and also safer to, to write code that won't uh, have memory issues. And then, of course, optionals um, is, is, is a bit of a unique thing. This is one that I really want you to pay attention to because, hey, I'm, I'm teaching a programming language. It feels almost like I shouldn't have to do that, right? You're a computer science student, so you just pick up programming languages for breakfast, right, usually. But uh, there are some concepts in Swift that are really quite unique and, and unusual, and those uh, I want you to pay special attention to because they will have a particular meaning. Like why are they there? And you might see these again in other contexts, um, and they are the ones that you know may trip you up when you write with, uh, with Swift. Optionals, in a very short you know way, are a way to express the fact that a value uh, that a variable may have a value, or it may not have any value. Like right? before you first initialized it with anything, for example. And there are some good situations in which you need that kind of thing, um, and uh, that's what optionals are there for. A couple more. Um, you can, you know, Swift works quite nicely with tuples as, as data types and also uh, multiple return values um, from, from a function. So that makes it easier to write, you know, smaller, you know, to let smaller units of code just do more in, in what they're doing. Generics um, let you develop code that you can use in many, many different scenarios. You probably know those from, uh, from C++ or other languages. Um, <clears throat> and there's also uh, very fast and concise iterating over collections. Again, that's a feature of most modern languages these days um, where you can say, hey, I got an array here or a, or, a, or a dictionary or something like this and I just want to do something to every single part of this, um, this data uh, collection. The next one I want to point out again, this is one again, that you need to pay attention to because this is going to become important. Uh, not just in UIKit, but even more so when we, towards the end of the class, talk about Swift UI. Uh, structs, you may remember those from, from your C or, or Java days, um, used to be this like, you know, 
not really amazingly exciting thing that just let you group a couple variables together, right, for uh, making a simple data structure. But usually you would go with classes, right, when you were doing object-oriented programming. So Swift actually um, massively improves the way that structs can be used and makes them much more powerful. And they become almost like a, um, a lightweight, uh, you know, cousin to the class concept. And they get used a lot, especially in, uh, in Swift UI. Um, they are much less uh, burden in terms of allocation and deallocation than class objects are, uh, instances are. So therefore, it's an important concept to hold on to. You can you know, use structs not just to contain a couple of variables, but they can actually contain methods, like classes can. They can have extensions and protocols, so a lot of the concepts that you know from classes actually apply to structs as well. Well, and then there are other functional modern programming patterns um, that you may know from other languages, again, like map filter, reduce, for example, uh, that are also available in Swift. Anybody have a quick explanation of what, what map filter reduces? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, if you iterate over an array, it's a filter, you can select something that matches that filter. Mm -hmm. With map, uh, you can perform like an operation on each item. Mm -hmm. And reduce is like, I don't know, for instance, either you have a counter variable or something like that, and you can add to that or not add to it based on what you can on the filter. Yeah, yeah. Or, or simply just adding up, for example, the elements in an array. That would be a typical reduce operation. Yeah. So. Um, in general, map filter use are all ap operations that basically let you do something with a function as a first class object, right? The function being, for example, the modification you want to do to every element in an array. Normally, you would go through, write a for loop, right, and, and then do it that way. And this way, you can specify the function um, as, a, uh, as a parameter and say, you know, please apply this function to this array, and then you don't have to write any iterations. You don't have to write any for loops. So it removes a lot of boilerplate code, a lot of you know, um, opportunities for mistakes, and also a lot of opportunities for writing suboptimal code in terms of performance. So uh, these, are, these are great ways to do this. And then it has a, its own um, pretty powerful error handling that lets you, you know, not just um, you know, make fewer mistakes while you're developing, but also kind of like predict in which scenarios co code could crash or perform unexpectedly. Now, um, how do you get to Swift? One way to use Swift is uh, if you just want to play with it really like low key. Um, oh, I should say, I, I didn't mention this, but Swift is actually a, uh, a cross-platform language. Um, you can uh, install Swift, of course, on, on Mac OS, uh, and it's, it's how you write applications for iOS as well, but there's also versions for Windows and for for uh, Linux, for example, Ubuntu and, and other um, dialects. So uh, you could do this on your Linux machine as well, right? at least as far as Swift goes. Right Now, when, once we get to UIKit, where you build iOS apps, that's a different uh, story. But the language itself is available on many different platforms. So to test the syntax of Swift, you can actually run what's known as the Rapid Evaluation and Print Loop, or REPL for short. Right? This is basically a, um, an iterative and an, an, an interactive command line that just lets you type in uh, Swift statements. You may know this from Python, for example. Right? Python is very known for, for being able to do that. Um, and so if you want to just write a very simple Swift uh, you know, statement or two, uh, you can do that right in, in the REPL. Um, and it's a, it's a very useful thing to do. If you want to call that up uh, and you've got Swift installed, then you just enter Swift REPL uh, like that, and that brings it up. And then you can enter you know, your own commands, and it will immediately evaluate them and do whatever you said you wanted them to do. If you want to get out, it's colon quit, um, and, and you're out. This is actually something uh, that did not exist at all in, in Objective-C uh, before. So it's a very fast way for you to try something out um, that you, know, you, can, you can use that as a, as a, on, on the terminal. So if you type that in, you're good to go. But it's also very bare bones, right? Obviously, right? It's good to check, you know, did I remember that syntax right? You know, how did that um, print statement, you know, how do you write that again? But if you want to get a little fancier, there is actually another thing that still doesn't necessarily mean that you create a full-blown Xcode project. Uh, it's called the playground. Playgrounds are another way to quickly test Swift code. Um, and they are part of Xcode. So you can, in Xcode, you can create a new full-blown project or you can just create a playground. That's actually something that you may find yourself, even as a developer, 
uh, of full-blown apps use as kind of like a scratch pad where you try out things, you know, test small pieces of code, and once you're happy with them, you bring them over into your project. Um, the playground is nice because it gives you kind of like the, the REPL, it gives you immediate results, but it does it in a, an even better way. Um, it does it in a way where when you enter you know, a couple lines of code here, you can actually see what each line of code does. Right? So it gives you the feedback on uh, what is the, the value that is being created here by, by each, of these, um, each of these commands. So we see that here on the right-hand side. Um, and then, of course, it has its own console output area down here at the bottom. Um, there's a, a couple things that you might uh, uh, you know, be interested in, uh, not just this part here for easy Express and seeing what the result is, uh, but also uh, there is a little button. If you, put, you know, if you click in front of a line, that means everything gets executed up to there. So basically run code up to this line, uh, lets you execute just the first couple lines of a short script. Or there is a button down here uh, where you can actually then execute your complete code. Um, and there's a little bit of a, uh, a trick here. Um, if you uh, press that button long, uh, if you do a long press on this one, then you can actually enable auto execution of the code. Normally, code does only execute when you press that for performance reasons, because all this you know evaluation happening all the time whenever you press a key is a bit expensive, it might drain your you know power you know, MacBook battery quicker than you might want. So, um, but you can turn it on by long pressing this. One. So this is. This is a, a, a useful environment, and that I encourage you to use when we are talking about Swift things here. Try these things out, right? When I say, uh, this is how you do you know, multiple return values, type a couple functions and, and just see how they work, and it lets you really nicely explore what's happening inside your code, especially because of these um, expressions here on the right-hand side. OK, now, uh, on to the actual Swift language. Um, rapid, rapid fire, right? Uh, if there's anything here that you don't understand, I do encourage you to get that textbook that we mentioned last time. Right? It's a free ebook that you can download, um, and it takes things at a much slower pace. Uh, but actually, it's quite nice. It, I also recommend using that because it has a couple uh, sort of self-testing questions at the end of each section. And you can just go through its fast, you know, uh, multiple choice questions, but it really helps you to see, all right, did I actually get that, or did I kind of skim over that and not did, did it not really sink in. All right, with this on, um, this is another thing that is unique in Swift. Um, not because other programming languages don't have the concept of a constant, right? That exists in every programming language. But because Swift programming style, the convention when you write Swift code is to use constants way more than you might be used to from anything else that you've used before, right? So the idea here is, um, when you declare a variable, you do this with var, uh, x equals 100. I'll talk about the types in a second. Uh, but you can also you know, declare a constant with the let keyword. And you will actually, the approach in Swift, writing good Swift code, means that you use constants as much as possible. So as long as the, the, the value that you put in there isn't going to change over the course of one run of that program, right? when you can technically use a constant, you tend to use it in Swift. This is quite different from other programming languages. And of course, it's one of these things that improves safety of your code. Because then, if you are sure this is not going to change during the execution of the code, and somewhere else you try to change it because you forgot your own concept early on, then your compiler is going to flag that for you, and it's going to point that out. So it's a, it's a design pattern in Swift, you could say. Um, so here is an example of what's going to happen if you, you know, type in this simple code here, uh, let x equals 1, var y equals 2, you can change y, of course. But if you're trying to change x, it'll actually tell you that it doesn't work because it's a, a constant that was declared with, with let. Next up, type inference. You can see here, I didn't actually give types to these things. right? Um, how does that work? Well, because Swift automatically chooses the right type uh, for a variable constant if it can. Right? If, if that information is provided. So if I say var x equals uh, 100, it actually derives from that initialization that this should be an integer value, uh, variable. This is why if I then try it in the next line to, uh, so, uh, to set it to 99.5, that won't work because it's become an integer through that initial line there. Um, the other way around, of course, works. Right? I can say 99.5, then it's a double. Uh, and then if I later so, uh, assign a 100 to it, 
that's good, right? 100 is an integer value that be, can be uh, converted into a double and then be assigned to that variable, so we're good. You can specify the type explicitly if you want to. Uh, and there are three cases in which that might be necessary. One is kind of obvious when there really isn't a useful initial value to assign to something, right? When you don't have a useful value to assign, um, maybe you don't want to assign a value uh, to start with um, because your code somehow relies on that, uh, then you can put the, um, the type behind the variable type, uh, uh, the variable name. The second case is um, that, you know, for example, in this case up here, I really want x to be a double, but I want to initialize it to 100. Well, I could, I could write 100.0, which is kind of a little bit of a hack, or I could say var x double equals 100. And then it would be, you know, the, the explicitly declared type, of course, takes precedence. Uh, the third reason is if you have your own type definition, of course, right? If you defined a, a, a struct or, or, or a class named person, for example, then um, you may want to put that uh, down there that because you may not be able to initialize that directly, right? More complex data types usually cannot be just initialized in, in line like that. And that's how you do it, right? You write the name of the variable and then a colon and the type. Let's take a look at this just with a couple examples here. Um, so these are examples for inference, but also shows how, how, you know, how to insert expressions into print statements and um, also shows you that you can use emojis as variable names if you want to. So here's, you know, x equals x1 equals 100, that's an int. Uh, this one is a double. Uh, this one is interesting. You would have thought probably that that works, right? You know, adding these two, why couldn't I add these two? Well, you can't because one is an int and one is a double and there's no automatic casting happening there. You actually need to do that explicitly. This is where um, Swift sort of rather errs on the side of safety rather than convenience. Um, so it really asks you to explicitly say, I want this to be interpreted as a double, and this is how you do that. Um, what works, however, is, you know, if you want to store the, uh, you know, the frequency of your favorite radio station directly as a number, then you can, you know, do it that way. You can say 0.5 plus 100. This works because the compiler does first does the addition, and it can do that with a, a proper casting, and then sets the type to be double, and then that can be associated um, or can be put into the variable. Um, of that type here. So um, uh, down here we have, you know, if we actually tried to output that, uh, we would get this output x4 equals 100.5. And uh, this also shows you, real brief here, how you actually output variable values inside in a print statement. You put a backslash and parentheses around it. I'll get back to that in a second, but just as a, as a um, teaser here. Finally, um, variable names can be um, letters, numbers, uh, even any, any Unicode letter. So uh, you can name your variable an emoji, or maybe a bit more useful, you could name a variable pi uh, actually with the symbol for pi, and that would be possible in your code. Now, you may call me an old hack, but I tend to not do that because I kind of like my source code to be sort of good old ASCII. But hey, if you want to go crazy, you can. Uh, until you try to, I don't know, email it or uh, do something else with it. Um, now, on to optionals. I said this is one of the you know, weird things in, in Swift, uh, or unique things, I should say. It's actually a pretty far, powerful thing. Um, we will cover this more in a future lecture because this is a, a fairly complex issue, but I want to introduce you to the concept so you can have it sink in and, and start thinking about it. So, you know how many uh, programming languages have the concept of a nil value for variables, right? Meaning like it, it, there's nothing in there, right? It's not set. Uh, and, and the guy who invented that uh, a, a nil um, concept once said this was probably one of the biggest blunders in his professional life to come up with that idea because it leads to so much code that then breaks later on. Objective-C loves nil, right? In Objective-C, you, you have things set to nil all the time. You can even send a message to nil. You can, you, know, you can basically call a, you know, a method on it, which in Objective-C would be sending messages, and it would just basically silently fail, right? So it was all designed around that being very, very possible and, and very, very normal. Um, this is where Swift takes a fundamentally different approach. So Swift does not, by default, variables 
um, you know, Swift does not let you set variables or constants to uh, nil. It's not possible. Um, that means you need a way to do that if you need that function, right? If you need variables to, you know, like an integer variable could be like age, let's say, right, of a person. Uh, it usually is an integer value, but maybe before that person is being, you know, the details are being filled in, you need that variable to have some kind of value. You probably want that to be nil or undefined or something like this. And if you need these kinds of things, then you can use optionals. Uh, and here's how you do that. Basically, i in this case is not a normal integer variable, it's an integer optional, meaning it can be any integer value, like normal integers, or nil. Okay, so I can you know, set it to three initially if I want to, and then later set it to nil, and that's fine. This would not work if the question mark wasn't there. Right? This marks the optional. Um, so normal values of variables and optionals are, however, not the same thing. Right? They are normally incompatible to each other. Why? Because otherwise we wouldn't have to bother with this whole thing. Right? We want to keep uh, our runtime safe. Right? We want to make sure that we don't suddenly run into trying to use the value of a variable and that var variable has never been initialized or it's set to nil uh, and we don't, you know, and, and the code fails. So if you have, you know, this call here, int of a string, that's a, as you can see, that's a method uh, that basically goes ahead and, you know, parses a string and returns a integer value. Does it though? Well, imagine yourself writing that parsing routine. You would probably have to live with the fact that people could parse you stupid stuff, right? They could pa pass you an empty string or, or ABC, right? And you cannot turn that into an integer, integer, right? So your method here clearly needs a way to say, uh, the thing I'm returning, I know it's supposed to be an integer, but there really was no integer value in that string you gave me. And that is when it returns nil. So that function int needs to be an optional function, right? Its return value is an optional integer. It can be integer or nil. Um, and so that's why, um, you know, this now means that if you do this assignment, number being assigned to this also is optional integer, right? Not a normal integer. And here's the same issue that we had before when we tried to add doubles and, um, you know, and, and ints, for example. Here you're trying to add an optional integer and a regular integer, and that doesn't work. And this will trip you up, right? This is something that you can fall for very easily. That's why I'm spending a little extra time introducing it here, and we'll come back to optionals later. Um, you know, this, simply because you know int question mark, you know, an optional int is not the same as int. Uh, this also gives you an error, right? If you try to explicitly declare a variable i of type integer and assign it the value number, it can't do that. I think here it's even more obvious why that's not possible because number could be nil because it's an optional int, and what is it supposed to then do? In that case, right? It doesn't make sense. Okay, so this is this is stuff that you should be aware of. We're going to talk more about optionals, but for now, uh, this should this should suffice. We'll see coalescing operators that let you turn optional values into basically uh, regular uh, regular values and optional chaining. It's it's a whole story on itself. Um, next up, tuples. This is a little easier. Uh, basically, you know, a tuple, of course, can contain multiple elements. Uh, these can be of different types, right? So I'm not just talking about uh, a collection of the same type because that would be more like an array or a set. Um, so a tuple can contain all these different things. And as you can see here, uh, you can actually um, take a tuple as a right-hand side expression and assign it to a whole bunch of variables, right? If you do this, then actually A will turn into an integer with the value 42, B will turn to double with the value 23.0, C will turn to a string, and D will turn to a boolean with a value true. So that's pretty powerful, right? And that, that kind of, that part may not confuse you, but this looks a little weird, right? Uh, four variables there um, in the, uh, on the left-hand side. Um, you can also then do things like uh, print out the second um, element of the tuple. Of course, they start, you know, zero indexed, as all good computer science concepts do. Uh, and so this is how you would get to individual parts of a, of a tuple. All right, next up, control flow. Um, we got to, you know, I'm not going to bore you with the details of if-else statements, but just to point out what's different here from languages that you might already know. Um, you know, mostly I'm going to be referring back to, to Java, and, and Java in itself is kind of, you know, syntax-wise very close to C, C, uh, C++ or stuff like this. Um, 
So here what we see, first of all, apart from the fact that we don't have any semicolons, right? If we write code, no semicolon at the end of the line. Um, you can see here in the if statement, you don't actually need to put the, uh, the condition in, in parentheses, right? So that was always something that kind of irked me in, in C. I found it unnecessary, and you don't have to do that here. You use the normal operators, like, you know, uh, logical operators. So here, this is an you know, uh, equality sign, of course, double equal uh, to compare things. Don't confuse that with the assignment equal. You know, I, I don't think I need to explain that to you. Um, uh, what I think is maybe uh, a little less common, although it's also available, of course, in Java and, and, and C and C++, is the ternary operator, or sometimes it's called the ternary conditional operator, which is a very shorthand way of writing an if-then-else assignment statement. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to write a function that's, you know, pick the largest of two numbers, um, then you could say, well, you know, if A is, you know, more than B, then I will assign largest to A, else uh, I, will, I will set it to B. That's perfectly valid code, but you can also collapse that into this one line. And this is the turning your operator at work, right? So if A, you read this as, as following, uh, set the value to largest to, if A is more than B, set it to A, else set it to B. Right? This is how the turning your operator um, works. It makes code more compact, and you actually come across it in Swift uh, quite a bit. Switch statements, also not exciting per se, you know them. Uh, there's always the question, you know, do they fall through or do they not fall through? Uh, there is no explicit fall through in Swift. This can trip you up because you may be used to explicit fall through from like say, let's say for example C. What I mean by this is, you know, in C if you wrote this then, and you had nothing that exited from any of these cases, you would execute all of these, right? They were just basically like, you know, address labels from assembler, you know, where you would jump to and there was nothing keeping you from, you know, keeping the program from running through. Um, that's not the case in Swift. Right? In, in, in Swift, automatically at the end of a case, um, the switch statement is exited. Okay, so that's something uh, to be aware of. I, I hope you've never used the, the, the fall through in C or something like this as a programming construct because it's really tough to read, but you know, if you did, don't do it here. Um, the other thing that's uh, maybe a bit interesting here is that you can actually use a, a whole bunch of different things. For example, what we see here is point is actually a tuple, right? See, it consists of two doubles here. Uh, and then we can switch on a tuple, right? We can switch on the value of a tuple. Now, how, we do, how do we do that if we don't know, if we on, only want to switch on a value of one part of that tuple, we can use a wildcard. That's the underscore here. It says, as long as, you know, if it's zero, zero, then, you know, print this. If it's anything else and zero on the y-axis, then we are on the x-axis, right? Um, if otherwise, we, we'd have to say because we don't fall through. Um, if it's anywhere on the, you know, if, if the x value is zero and the y axis is anything, then we are on the y axis with our point and else we are, well, somewhere else. Um, Swift requires switch statements to be exhaustive. So you always have to have all possible cases covered. That's also something um, to be aware of. On the right hand side, we have some examples of uh, ranges. Um, so we can use something like a whole range, you know, any, you know, if distance is, you know, it's, it's obviously an int value. So I can do a case uh, 0 to 9 or 10 to 500 or otherwise, you know, anything else too far away or possibly negative. Who knows? Um, so that's an example on how you can use um, whole ranges. All right. So let's do uh, the last round uh, for today's class which is about the seminar, right? So this is gonna come up in a couple of weeks, there's still plenty of time, but we need you guys to know now what kind of seminar topics we're gonna to be offering so that you can start uh, voting on them, which will be one of the tasks you'll be doing. So the way the seminar works, once it starts, and you can see this starts on you know, the 22nd of, uh, of November and it goes all the way uh, until right before Christmas, uh, we will be having uh, weekly sessions, you know, same time slots as today, Monday and Tuesdays. But during that time, there will be two seminar talks at each of these days, right? So there will be two talks happening per, uh, per lecture slot, if you want. And uh, you need to be there, right? It's like a seminar. Uh, attendance mandatory. If you miss more than one, uh, then you failed the seminar part. Uh, you may still be able to pass the class as a whole, but that's going to... Uh, impact your grade, as you can see from the uh, the grading scheme. 
how does this work? Well, you will be giving a 15 minute presentation on a, on a topic um, and after that there will be about 10 minutes left for discussion. So, you know, uh, we'll be asking questions about the seminar topics, other students might be asking questions. Uh, we'll have groups of three in this, so you'll be working on your seminar topic with two other people. And um, we haven't fixed the order of you know, which topics are going to be coming up when yet, um, because that will also, of course, depend on what exactly you are uh, going to be voting on. Uh, voting will be happening in Moodle, and we ask that only one person per group votes. We don't need groups, you know, votings uh, uh, tripled. One week before your presentation time slot, which you know, presentation will be on one of these days, one week before that, uh, you need to have everything done and we will have a test run and discuss your slides with you. So we will give you um, an early feedback there, go over the slide and uh, discuss uh, the content of the presentation. Uh, this is not so that you can then start with our input, start working on your actual presentation. You, know, you need to be done by that point. This is just because we want to make sure that what you're doing is also actually going to be uh, a good quality for everybody else in the room, right? Because remember, you're not just telling us this for your grade, you're also sharing this with your fellow students so that they understand the topic, right? So you're, you're part of the teaching staff in a way. Um, what do we expect in a typical seminar talk? Well, uh, this is not a list of API calls, right? So don't just throw API, um, you know, lines with API calls at us. We want you to give us an overview of what is the framework about, what is the concept in this thing? Why is it there? What's, what, what, why would we need this kind of, kind of thing? And then each framework usually has a couple of very basic concepts, right? Ways to use it. It introduces certain, certain um, you know, design patterns or programming paradigms or, 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 um, or artifacts like you know, objects or classes that we need to know about and need to understand. So you explain these basic steps. You, you give us a basic instruction on how do you solve a very fundamental problem with this framework? And then you can go into a couple more details on one or two extra uh, advanced uh, features in, inside that and show us how to use them as well. Um, in most cases, uh, you can actually do your demo using either UIKit or SwiftUI. Right? So uh, you'll be open to pick either one of those. Uh, while we will cover more time on UIKit, uh, SwiftUI may be the easier one, you know, the faster one to rig up a demo with, and it depends on personal preference what you what you like better. Um, so, we are planning for you to also have uh, a code demo in there, so that we can see, um, you know, how to actually use this in working code, and uh, that is one of the deliverables. Right? So, both the slides and the the demo code are are your deliverables. Um, we, if you agree, we will tape your talk, both for everybody else to be able to watch it, but also for you to review and see how you did in your presentation. It's very helpful to see yourself presenting. Later on, you can see, oh, I kept you know, fiddling with my remote or something, or I, I kept pointing at stuff and shaking like crazy. So these kinds of things are easiest for you to, to pick up yourself. All right, so with that, I'll give you a brief rundown of the topics that are available, just so that you have an idea of what it is about. Um, I will also say very briefly what possibly could be a sample application that you build with this or a sample problem that you solve with this. We didn't put these on the slide because we don't want everybody to just say, oh, I need to program this, right? because that's not the point. We just want to give you an idea of what it could be. Um, and we're certainly not expecting you to do exactly that. Uh, so the first one is on core animation. Um, or the, the CA framework uh, is about drawing and animating uh, things on the screen. So you'll be looking at a lot of you know, fundamental graphics concepts, layers, paths, shapes, clipping, rasterization, keyframe animations, um, core animations, display link. You know, those kinds of things will be in there. And one possible thing that, that could be going on there is to show uh, how to create a widget that is irregularly shaped on the, on the screen, uh, maybe with gradients and shadows and those kinds of things. So clearly moving beyond what you typically see with your, with your straight, simple uh, drawing routines. Um, another one, haptics and sound. Uh, enriching interaction with sound and haptic feedback. This is two modalities that we're throwing into one here. And you can look at things like AV audio player, audio session, 
um, or the media player is now playing Info Center um, or the UI feedback generator. These are some you know, examples for classes that you look at. And uh, a possible demo here could be, let's say, like a, a, a basic music player app. Uh, maybe one that lets you, um, you know, play, uh, you know, create a playground music player app and uh, let it play back audio. Maybe I can control it from the lock screen. Uh, maybe it shows the current title in the uh, in, in control center in your in your iPhone. Um, maybe the play button, you know, has a haptic effect when I press it, so that the haptic haptics are also part of this. Uh, these are things that you could do in this in this area. Next up, core image and, and core image filters. Um, this is all about fast image processing and analysis. So, um, you know, the framework uh, contains a lot of interesting ways to process visual data. Uh, so, manipulating images, you know, with filters, with with effects and stuff like this. This is all built into the OS, uh, and you can show how that how that works. So, you could look at things like automatic enhancements of a picture, which is available, or, or you know, the core image detector um, uh, classes. Uh, next up, SpriteKit. Um, SpriteKit is used a lot for 2D games. Right? For simple games, um, SpriteKit is an excellent tool, and you could actually build maybe you know, a simple game with no, no textures or, or 3D objects required, where you have like, I don't know, like a ball maybe that I create with touch and um, that um, I can then you know, roll around on the ground with, you know, with the physics engine applied to it, because that's also something that, that, core, uh, that, that SpriteKit covers. Um, working with files, how do you actually, you know, remember how we said initially, you know, iOS as a mobile uh, um, environment is really a, a closed shop, right? It's, it's an app-centric environment. You usually work in your app. But nowadays, there are ways to get out of, out of your app and get into, for example, the, the file system uh, where then the files app can access it and, and make it available for further applications. So how do you save data to a file and then find it in the, in the files app? How do you do that? That's actually something that a lot of apps will need, so it's quite useful knowledge to have. Um, and understanding how file managers work or file handles, document browsers, stuff like this. Um, you could, for example, then write an app that you know, takes the tab locations that you create in the app, saves them all to a file, and then makes them available um, through the files app, and then I can upload it in numbers and look at my actual tab locations. You know, that would be an example. Combine. This is one of the slightly more advanced topics uh, for you guys. Uh, this is about declarative event processing, right? So you would look at the publish subscribes, uh, publish subscribe pattern or publish subscribe semantics, um, where you know one part of, of your code uh, just puts information that it wants to share on sort of you know events like on the blackboard, you could say, and then anybody who's interested in that can subscribe to particular events in this. That's where the the name publish subscribe comes from. And um, you know, how does that work? How do you, can you use cancelables of combined to to do declarative UIs with UIKit. So without moving to Swift UI, which is a declarative framework, how could I do this um, you know, in, in UIKit with that? Uh, so some simple examples for combined pipelines would be a good uh, demo uh, to give here. Um, then we got everybody's favorite topic, debugging. Right? So debugging in Xcode, uh, how do you use the debugger to find, you know, to find bugs, but also to, to check performance, right? to see Am I actually, you know, uh, syncing some performance that I'm not noticing right now because I have a fairly fast machine and my data sets are small, but am I actually creating bottlenecks later on when people deploy my code with larger, uh, you know, consumer or customer data on, on, on uh, slower machines? Um, you would, you know, you could look at, you know, the, the, the everybody's favorite printout, uh, uh, you know, print debugging, but, you know, how do you, uh, handle exceptions, how do you work with breakpoints, how do you work with member leaks. So there should be more than just showing us how a breakpoint works, right? We want to see a little bit more in this demonstration. It could also be, a, a, that's probably also one of the more advanced topics. If you already know Xcode a bit and want to share what you know about the debugger here, uh, this could be a good one. Um, and of course the demo should be debugging something, right? We want to see, want to see that stuff in action. Um, next up, displaying rich articles. Uh, we often run into the problem in our apps that we write uh, for, for customers that we need to actually, for example, display HTML formatted content. Right? That's, that's a fairly uh, frequent request. Um, and um, how do you do that? There are, there are, of course, plenty of ways to display text in a, in a UIKit or a Swift UI 
uh, app, but um, these are gonna, you know, this is a different way to do this uh, using web views. Um, and uh, you can learn this way how you render HTML formatted stuff into uh, an application. So it's a great way to show how to integrate this external data. Um, next up, MapKit. Um, anything you can do with maps, right? Not just uh, you know, finding locations, but also adding annotations to a map, like pins or other things, adding overlays, shapes, you know, paths, maybe tiles, um, how the user's location is being uh, displayed and, and how to get directions. Um, all of that, of course, has its own API calls in the MapKit SDK. Um, and uh, this is what you're going to be looking at with this. Uh, we have UI presentation controller, which is um, a, uh, a little bit of a more sort of you know, low-level technical thing to go into UIKit. Um, this is a, uh, an example where you create your own custom view controller. A view controller, um, you know, so it's a, your own presentation style that you create here. So, for example, you might be creating a style that lets me open a view similar to how you know this 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 zoom effect that the photo app has when I when I open an image in the photos app, right? It pops into into view. Uh, but that's not something that is available by default. So you know, can you recreate that in your own view controller that in your presentation controller that you can then actually offer um, to use in other um, in other applications. Next up, machine learning. Ooh, it's the the umami of modern computing. Of course, uh, makes everything taste better. So machine learning in iOS is also available. There are um, uh, several SDKs. There is um, Core ML and Create ML um, as, a, as an actual companion app, so to say, to let you not just um, create simple machine learning models, but also then load them up into an app and use them to, to uh, do something with it. So you'll look at the framework in general, but uh, then focus on um, image classification as a typical example. So for example, a, a simple demo could be creating a very simple model with, with uh, create ML and then use it in an app to classify things in the live camera image. You know, that could be uh, something to do with that. Um, core data um, is a very powerful persistent data base uh, model that, that um, iOS provides. It's basically your, your you know, first uh, stop when you want to say, I have a bunch of data in tables and, and, and rows that, that my you know, user is creating, uh, I don't know, recipe coll collection or whatever, and I need to store this stuff somehow, right? And I don't want to go all you know, SQL or something like this. So um, core data is a great tool that gives you these kinds of things essentially for free. Um, also gives you for free things like undo, redo. I mentioned that last time. Um, so you can look at managed objects, um, you know, at view contexts, how requests, are, you know, how, how you issue fetch requests to get some data from the uh, from the model, um, and also how you can use the graphical model model editor that that uh, Xcode provides to create simple relational models yourself that you can then directly use in your in your code. Um, so you could maybe write like a simple reminders app or something like that uh, with a with a search tool included. Now, if you want to leave the iPhone behind, um, you could do something for the watch, right? Uh, the watch is also programmed using iOS, um, and but of course there are things that are different in designing for the watch because again, different size, different input devices, right? You've got this digital crown here instead of um, you know, any other user interface components. And um, you're going to learn about what are the limitations of, of you know, this particular UI toolkit that's available for the watch. Um, how, does, how does the phone talk to the watch? How are they um, communicating? How do you lay out things in a watch app? And uh, what are some of the special widgets that are available on the watch as opposed to the phone? You can actually do this uh, using WatchKit, which is sort of the equivalent to UIKit on the phone. Um, or you can use SwiftUI, the, the more modern one. Apple is kind of pushing uh, towards people using SwiftUI, but uh, we'll leave it up to you which one you want to want to pick for that. Uh, and then we have a couple things around augmented reality. Uh, first of all, ARKit, which has been around for quite some time, um, is a way to show AR content inside a 3D graphics engine. So um, a simple example app here would be to 
uh, detect the floor plane, you know, and then just add objects on this floor plane um, at the location where the user is tapping on the on the phone. Right? Um, so placing AR content into the into the environment, um, and that will teach you about things like AR anchors and and the onboarding, the plane detection algorithms, the hit testing, etc. Um, if you want to get uh, a little beyond that, then you can do uh, Reality Kit, Reality Composer which are tools to simulate and render 3D content in AR. So you'd be looking at how to prototype three AR scenes and applications uh, and how they interact with the uh, environment. So these are closely related, of course. And finally, um, uh, Swift UI is designed to be extremely declarative. So I'm in, unlike UI Kit, which we'll be covering the next couple of weeks, when we get to Swift UI, you'll see that Swift UI isn't so much about saying exactly how I want something laid out, but rather saying, what do I want the end result to be? And let the toolkit figure out how to get there. So your control of, over the layout with SwiftUI is a little looser. Uh, and the system, the toolkit, the framework determines more things itself, um, depending on what target platform it's running on, whether it's an iPhone, an iPad, or even the Mac, or, or a watch. Um, and so with advanced SwiftUI layout, we're trying to uh, get into the question of how do I still get great looking Swift UI apps that look really polished and like you know, are exactly how I want them to be when I have this declarative uh, framework. So there are some things like geometry readers, um, priorities uh, that you can give when you're uh, when layouting, um, fixed dimensions, alignment guides, etc. All these things that that uh, Swift UI offers to um, get to uh, you know a good layout in Swift UI. Um, okay, so that's, those are the topics, as you can see, I think this is more topics than we have groups at this point, right? We have 40 groups. Yeah, so uh, not all the topics will, be, will, will get picked. Um, and if you have that one framework that we haven't mentioned here that you are extremely excited about and that you want to share with us, you know, no matter what, do talk to Renee and, uh, uh, and Oli and, and ask them about it. Maybe we can put something together for that as well. In summary, for today, we're already at the end of the class. So we've covered uh, a couple first things about Swift, right? You know, we've tried to show you uh, what's a bit unique about Swift. Um, things like uh, optionals are unique. Things like the role of structs, which we'll get to more in, in future classes, uh, are, are unique. Um, and um, it is designed to be a fast, uh, safe, and expressive language. We've looked at a couple um, things in Xcode, so Renee has given you a tour of how to use Xcode in order to um, get started and, and you know, get your first app built and run. And, and next time we will take a look at strings uh, and classes and structs. As I said, classes and structs are quite related in Swift and it's really important to understand the difference between the two because you will actually find that they're used in sometimes in ways where you would maybe think that you would use them opposite way around. And of course, uh, you will have to think about your seminar topics, right? So what's next for you guys is to vote for your topic. One person per group goes into Moodle and votes for their topic. How do you vote? Uh, let's say the computer scientists and us went a little crazy in this, but we're going to make you rank all topics, okay? One through 16. And if you don't care about the bottom eight, just give them any rank, you know, something random that you but you have the option to really fine tune it. The reason for that is if we do it that way, we, you know, the algorithm that runs in Moodle actually delivers the best matching results for everybody. So um, sorry to put you through this, but like I said, you don't have to, you know, you break your heart over the exact ranking between place 14 and 15, right? Usually in the past, what, like first six, first eight, top eight, six to eight were usually what we were able to get everybody, right? Right. Usually it's like top, top five. Yeah. So, but it is that because we make everybody rank everything. Okay. So uh, that's why this is important. And um, the deadline for that is uh, the 19th, Wednesday, uh, 1 o'clock. So, and we will publish the results right after that on Thursday so that you all know um, what topic you ended up with. With that, we're going to wrap up the class for today. Thanks for being here. And I hope to see you guys again for the next class, which is already tomorrow, right?
All right, thank you. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.